there are three pillars to a successful movement, stories, tools, and faith. We've heard amazing stories the last 24 hours, and many of us are building the tools for democracy. But what I want to talk about is faith, my struggle with faith. Growing up, I had two loves, Jesus and the internet. <laughs> my uh, dad worked for IBM, and my family moved out to Silicon Valley when I was very young. Um, our home happened to be right across the street from a church. Uh, this wasn't any church, though. Uh, this church had thousands of members and was ground zero for Jerry Falwell's new moral majority movement on the West Coast. I was born again when I was eight. Um, I put my faith in Jesus and became quite the precocious young conservative. Uh, as a teenager, I developed a fiercely independent worldview. I went on mission trips, I listened to Rush Limbaugh, I called talk radio, all while my mom homeschooled my two sisters and I, trying to protect us from the corrupting influences of the secular world. Then one day, my dad brought home this funny-looking phone and plugged it into his computer. It made this bizarre screeching noise like it was trying to mate with a rhinoceros or something. Uh, <laughs> instead, it attracted me. Um, <laughs> that's when I found out that computers could talk to each other. From that point on, I would, uh, it, was, it was all over for me. Right? I would uh, do my schoolwork in the morning, I would go to church three times a week, and then I would go online. And I'd meet all kinds of people, hackers, feminists, punks, Tori Amos fans, people far older than me who had no idea that I was 12 years old. I was judged by my brain, not discounted because of my age. I loved it. I went to college at Liberty University. This is where Jerry Falwell trained young soldiers to go out into the kingdom of God and, and, and into every profession and win it for the kingdom of God. It was a massive operation, uh, thousands of students on campus, tens of thousands off campus, all connected by a global network of churches and an infrastructure that dated back 2,000 years. My role was in the computer lab. I spent all my time there. Um, I brought the internet to campus. I set up Liberty's first website. I even fixed Dr. Falwell's computer. But by spring break, I'd run out of breath. Literally, I couldn't breathe. I had cancer, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I started chemo right away uh, with my family and the church by my side, but um, two weeks into it, we found out that my mom had cancer too. Nine rounds of chemo later, uh, I survived, she didn't. Our family was destroyed, and my faith in God was left shattered. I, uh, my ticket out of all of this mess was at a startup in Boston. Um, but just six months into it, the cancer came back. Uh, this time it was in my blood. Uh, my only chance was if they could find a bone marrow donor. And even then, it was a long shot. I had maybe a 10% chance of surviving. So uh, the doctors started looking, um, but then uh, the doctors started looking, but then I spent two months in the hospital getting hammered with chemo. The, uh, I was in the ICU constantly. I almost died a couple of times. Um, I was had so much pain that I had this button to push, right? And every time I pressed it, I would be injected with pharmaceutical grade heroin. Every time I did, I felt defeated and broken. I just wanted to end. God had forsaken me. But the doctors hadn't. They found a donor. I spent two weeks uh, getting baked in an oven of radiation, and then early one morning, groggy from all the Benadryl, I watched as a small bag of marrow emptied into my arm. I walked out of the hospital two weeks later, replenished with the blood of a stranger. I was determined to sort of move on with my life, so I gave my heart to the internet. I was the, uh, an engineer at Lycos, one of the first search engines. I uh, was a CTO at business.com, all up until 9-11. Then the activist in me awoke. I was under no illusions that I could actually change anything, but I knew this was a historic moment and that if I didn't at least try, I would regret it in 10 years. Robert Greenwald was looking for someone to research the Iraq war for his first documentary. Um, I sent him a link to my blog and the next day I was a movie producer. <laughs> Four crazy intense months later, we drove up to our very first screening at an indie theater in Santa Monica. The line was around the block. We added a second screening that night, and in a matter of weeks, 
Thousands of screenings all over the world were organized by activists, all coordinated through the internet. And bit by bit, the media changed the way they talked about the war. Holy crap, this works. My faith was restored, but it wasn't faith in God. It was faith in the internet. Or, or, no, it was faith in people connected through the internet. We went on to start Brave New Films. Uh, we made several documentaries. We crowdfunded films. We changed things that I never even thought were possible, all by telling stories and connecting people through the internet. And then I ran out of breath, again. All the radiation treatments that I'd had years before for the cancer had scarred my lungs to the point where I couldn't even walk up the steps. They had to be replaced, double lung transplant. I needed someone to die so that I could be saved. First, I had to get on the list. Uh, all of the statistics for lung transplants are posted online, and UCLA had the best ones on the West Coast. But they took one look at my file and said, forget it, the surgery was too complicated. Come on! Ugh. I was really pissed, so I blogged about it. Um, I called the surgeons at UCLA a few names, which I probably shouldn't repeat here, but then something amazing happened. One of the volunteers at Brave New Films saw the post and she wrote an email to the generic UCLA email address uh, accusing them of only doing easy surgeries to artificially inflate their statistics. <laughs> then my sister wrote an email, then all my friends wrote an email. This is what happens when your friends are activists. Um, two weeks later, I got a call from the scheduler at UCLA. I told her they had already rejected me. She said, I, I don't know, you're on my list, you need an appointment. I met with the surgeon, and he said he'd been forwarded the emails. Um, my case had been rejected before it had even gotten to him. You know, lung transplant surgeons have many great qualities, but uh, humility is not one of them. No one was going to accuse him of being afraid of his surgery. <laughs> there were many more hurdles for us to uh, cross. Uh, the, uh, uh, the health insurance companies tried to, um, tried to weasel out of it. The, the uh, transplant board kept coming up, kept coming up with excuses. Um, I had no more tests to do every single week. But my friends, my family, their friends, and a bunch of people from the internet all fought to get me on the list. And they got me on the list. A year later, the phone rang. Then my stepmom's phone rang. Then my dad's phone rang. It was time. As I was prepped for the surgery, I wasn't thinking about Jesus or whether my heart would start beating again after they stopped it or whether I would go to heaven if it didn't. I was thinking about all the people who had gotten me here. I owed every moment of my life to countless people I would never meet. Tomorrow, that interconnectedness would be represented in my own physical body. Three different DNAs. Individually, they were useless, but together, they would equal one functioning human. What an incredible debt to repeat. I didn't even know where to start. And that's when I truly found God. God is just what happens when humanity is connected. Humanity connected is God. There was no way I would ever repay this debt. It was only by the grace of God, your grace, that I would be saved. The truth is, we all have this same cross to bear. We all owe every moment of our lives to countless people we will, we will never meet. Whether it's the soldiers who give us the freedoms because they fight for our country, right, or it's the surgeons who give us the cures that keep us alive. We all owe every moment of our lives to each other. We are all connected. We are all in debt to each other. What the, the internet gives us the opportunity to repay just a small part of that debt. As a child, I believed in creationism, that the universe was created in six days. Today, we are the creators. We each have our own unique skills and talents to contribute to creating the kingdom of God. We serve God best when we do what we love for the greatest cause we can imagine. What the people in this room do is spiritual, it is profound. We are the leaders of this new religion. We have faith that people connected can create a new world, 
Each one of us is a creator, but together, we are the creator. about the person whose lungs I now have is that he was 22 years old and six feet tall. I know nothing about who he was as a person, but I do know something about his family. I know that in the height of loss, when all anyone should have to do is grieve, as their son or their brother lay motionless on the bed, they were asked to give up to seven strangers a chance to live. And they said yes. Today, I breathe through someone else's lungs while another's blood flows through my veins. I have faith in people, I believe in God, and the internet is my religion. All I can say is that in the eight years that we've been trying to put on this conference, no one has represented what we believe, what we care about more than this gentleman standing next to me, Jim Gilliam. I am in heaven, I hope you are too. <laughs> Let's make his vision happen. Thank you. Thanks.